Um, we've got a briefing about the Advanced Railers Trans with um, two guests from Urbis, but I might just set the scene and I'll just stop my share so I can hand over to Graham and Brett in a moment. But just for people who may not have all the background, I'll spend just a couple of minutes giving some context. Um, we, as Committee for Geelong, went over to China late 2019 prior to COVID with Urbis and Deakin on a delegation to explore this technology. And this came out as a result of feedback we had from a few members who are involved with the Northwest growth area. So this is the new big um, residential growth area um, that's currently going through um, PSPs have had their growth area gazetted by the Minister for Planning, but part of it is what transport solutions could they look for this new growth area, which is over 110,000 people planned. Massive, massive area of growth for Geelong. And um, these members, I think it was uh, Todd uh -huh. Devine. Oops, sorry, I'll just mute that person. Todd Devine from um, Costa Asset Management and um, at the time Greg Bursell from Lovely Banks went over and they said they saw this technology and were blown away by it and felt that it would be a great solution for the Northwest Growth Area and Geelong more generally. So we went over to China and um, it was just an incredible experience. So Graham and Brett were with us. Um, since that time, the Committee for Geelong obviously COVID hit. There's been a few challenges there, but um, we've been talking to the state government in great detail around what this technology could look like, which is a, a way to encourage not only people getting on transport, but obviously having a tram-like experience in Geelong. As we know, light rail is incredibly expensive to install. Um, further to that, we put a proposal to the state government last year for a trial in Geelong. So there was some publicity around that in October last year, and we've been working consistently with the Victorian government. Obviously, Com Games has, has exacerbated, is that the right word, has accelerated some discussions around this. And we're hopeful of, um, you know, the state government giving us some more significant feedback about that. But as you know, if you jumped on earlier, we're in caretaker mode now, full election mode. We thought, why not run a bit of a campaign? So part of this briefing really is for members to be advocates for this project, to be well-versed and educated about the technology, um, and also to be able to um, obviously make sure our members are aware of, um, you know, the opportunities, whether it's in their district area business or otherwise. So what I might do is I hope I've covered everything from our perspective, but what I'll do is I'll hand over to Brett Fleming first and then I think Graham McKay will speak. But Brett will just provide an overview from Irvis's point of view more generally about the work they've been doing um, with this technology. And then Graham is our transport specialist and he'll provide an overview of the technology and why it is very special and different and why it's a great opportunity for Geelong. So Graham did the proposal and the, the um, suggested route for Geelong for the trial. So probably enough from me. Um, I might hand over to you, Brett, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everyone. Um, my um, my background is I'm a town planner by by trade. I work for a company called Urbis in, in based in Melbourne, and we've got an office in Geelong as well. Um, my trackless tram or advanced railless um, transport journey started in in early 2019, um, where I attended a workshop in Wyndham where this technology was being talked about. And, coincidentally, as Jen said, it was all also being considered um, in Geelong in the northwest. Um, growth corridor as, as one of the options to sort of provide some high capacity public transport um, up in that part of the world. Through a series of, of coincidences, I was lucky enough to go visit the site or visit the factory in Ebin um, in China um, myself, and then subsequently went back for another visit with Graham um, from our team and also with, with Jen and a few others from the committee to, to Geelong. Um, in all honesty, my first visit, I was I was somewhat cynical as to the value of the technology um, and was telling everybody who was asking why I was going to China that I was going to see a bus with a body kit um, on it. Um, I was, as Jen says, the, the, the guys from sort of Northwest Geelong, I was pretty blown away by what I saw. Um, so two things probably struck me. First was that I, I could genuinely, as a layman, um, see a, a, a tangible use for this technology in, in Australia, um, in Victoria, Melbourne, Geelong. Um, I, I saw it particularly in our new communities corridor as a way to get some high quality public transport in a space which wouldn't be able to afford 
um, any of anything other than a bus really that that tend to turn up on an ad hoc basis and isn't particularly pop popular, particularly in Victoria. And then the second thing that occurred to me is that I was vastly out of my depth in terms of being able to do a critical assessment of this, this technology, which is where I reached out to Graham um, for his expertise being our public transport traffic expert. Um, and he's subsequently been able to undertake a bit more of a um, factual and thorough assessment of this thing to sort of offset my, my layman's views. So Graham, I might pass over to you to do most of the talking um, and I can, I can chip in as required. Yeah, great. Thank you, Brett. I will just share my screen. All right, great. Um, hopefully everybody can uh, now see that. So I will um, just take the silence as a yes uh, and get underway. So um, th thanks, Jen, for uh, inviting me to uh, talk to the committee. Um, for those with a keen eye, you will we'll actually see Brett, Jen and Carly Lovell from Deakin University in my background. Um, so this is my background is actually from uh, the site visit uh, that we did. And that's uh, one of the end of route charging stations on the T1 line in uh, Ebin in southwest China. Um, so to... Get going. Okay, so just to provide a bit of context, um, technically, yes, this is a bus um, under the National Heavy Vehicle Regulations and uh, Australian uh, design rules, but it's also not a bus. It is a road operating tram. So as you can see here from this uh, video from uh, our factory visit, it is a tram um, that is on the road and operates like a bus, but has all the comfort and amenity levels uh, that you that everybody associates uh, with trams. And I don't know if there's anyone old enough to have ridden a tram in, in Geelong before they were they were uh, ripped out. Um, but it does give you that same level of comfort and and feeling as you as you get from riding on a vehicle that uh, runs uh, steel wheels on steel rails. So to, to give a bit of context about um, the advanced railless tram, um, the, there are other vehicles that are used uh, in Australia um, and around the world. So obviously we have tracked trams in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Gold Coast, uh, Ballarat, Bendigo. Um, in other parts of the world, they're called what are called rubber tired trams where they have rubber tires uh, like the uh, ART vehicle does um, but then they have a guide rail uh, in the in the middle of the vehicle uh, which uh, enables the tram to uh, keep on a track and interestingly enough there are lots of rubber tired trains around the world so people don't think of trains as having rubber tires but there are quite a quite a lot of networks and uh, pretty much every people mover in any airport in the world is also a rubber tired train. Uh, there's another classification of, of grouping of vehicles, which is called a tram bus, which is a bus that has a, a body kit to look like a tram, but it still has all the same features of a bus. So it has lots of seats, very little standing capacity, has a single motor, uh, has very limited uh, steering uh, and the Brisbane Metro, um, which is made by a Swiss company called Hess, uh, which is the, the, the vehicle is under trial at the moment, is a bus, um, but it looks very much like a tram. And then obviously we have standard buses, um, which I think everybody knows what one of those is. Um, and sorry, the, and standard buses can come in numerous forms. So they can be uh, a uh, standard body, a long body, double deck articulated. So when it comes down to how these vehicles actually operate, there's uh, what are called rail vehicles and they come under the National Rail Safety Law and they apply to trams, light rails, metros and trains. Um, so anything that operates on a physical track. Then you have a bus, which is a passenger vehicle up to 19 metres length um, and can only have up to one articulation in it. And then you have unclassified vehicles, 
which generally includes things like oversized cranes or a vehicle that's carrying uh, wind turbine blades. They're, so they're very specific vehicles for specific purposes. And the Brisbane Metro vehicle uh, falls into this category, as does the ART vehicle. So it requires a special permit to, to operate on Victorian roads and also an importation uh, license. So that's that's pretty much the, the, uh, the technicalities um, out of the way of how uh, this could, could actually operate. So what is the, the, the vehicle, before I describe the actual vehicle itself, so what does it feel like? I'm not sure if the sound was was playing then, but that you know general general background noise. I think of um, uh, Jen and Carly asking uh, questions um, as we're traveling traveling along. But the context of this piece of video is that we were traveling at. 48 kilometers an hour. And I was standing in the middle of the cabin, holding on to nothing, holding my phone in portrait mode, touching nothing. So that's the level of quality of comfort that, that you get. And what the, the difference in the quality of comfort enables you to have the tram interior. And I'll talk a little bit about the differences, why, why that is between that and any form of bus uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so the way the tram works is that it, use, it, it follows uh, the, the, sorry, uh, I'm just getting my, point, my laser pointer. So it follows these two lines and it uses a very precise GPS system to keep the vehicle operating in a very, very tight configuration to the point in that this road that it was operating wasn't built to take uh, heavy vehicles following an, an exact path. So you actually have this very slight area where the pavement has had to be, be repaired um, because of the, the nature of the precision of the vehicle. But what, what they are doing now is that you can actually program the vehicle. So it'll actually move a, a few millimetres either side as it's going along. So you're not getting that that single uh, uh, spot of, of, of damage within the pavement. In, in China, the official government policy is that they will only be using trackless trams for cities in, in the one to five million people mark. They will not be building metros. So you will have a bus-based system for cities uh, under a million, and metro-based systems for cities above 5 million. So in EBIN, they have built as, as part of a, a, um, what's gonna be a 200 kilometer long network, they are building super, I'll call them super duper stops because they're like a tram super stop in Melbourne, but then with toilets and vending machines and ticket gates and, uh, automatic um, uh, door gates uh, on them, so it's a it's it's a much much higher quality of um, of type of stop. But you can just do you can start out with the trial using a single bus stop, normal bus stop, and you can increase the level of. The, the, the bus stop plat, pad up to 295 millimetres, um, so you can have level boarding. Uh, and because it's a 100% walkthrough vehicle, the uh, anyone who has a mobility issue, so long as the, so long as the vehicle keeps on stopping at the same door at that uh, uh, stop during the trial phase, um, can have access to it, which, which is actually pro probably improved on what they might get. Um, currently with, with some uh, uh, bus operations and, and, and qualities of stops. Um, so this is just showing the vehicle pulling into, the, into one of the stops. 
So it, it, it can uh, operate in dedicated lanes or mixed traffic. So you can see this is, this is crossing a uh, four lane uh, bridge across the Yangtze River. Um, and you can actually see that uh, there is a uh, taxi in the lane uh, uh, up there in the same lane. And in the other direction, while there's no tram coming, uh, there are um, vehicles using the lane. So, you know, while any on-road public transport always works better when it has a dedicated lane, it doesn't have to uh, operate uh, within a dedicated lane. And if there is an operational issue, such as, a, a you know, if that taxi um, broke down, um, if you had a tracked tram, you wouldn't be able to have any service. Um, this vehicle can be manually driven uh, like a bus. Um, and it has the same turning circle as a standard 12 and a half meter bus. And I'll, I'll explain why that, why that is uh, a little bit later on. And Graham, we saw a, a mix and match, didn't we, between sort of autonomous driving, um, which itself docked at every, every, every stop, but yes. also autonomous driving on the road, as well as that manual driving, which was, which was interesting to be in the cab watching them. Um, yes. Watching yes. them do that. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, what uh, us um, engineers call a level two plus self-driving vehicle. So you can't, it doesn't, you can't send it out on its own without a driver, uh, but during its normal operation, so long as the driver is uh, ready to take over control uh, and they control the doors uh, on the vehicle as well, um, then the vehicle will um, generally uh, be in control, in com in, including communicating with the traffic signals in order to get uh, priority uh, through, through the lights. So going back to what makes the, the comfort and ride um, so, so much more, I suppose, special than, than a bus, uh, and like Brett, when I went over there, I was like, oh yeah, this is just gonna be another bus. Um, and, it, and it's not. And, and there's a couple of primary uh, reasons in, in that. So if you think about a bus or a truck, um, their suspension is at the wheels. So when you're going over a rough surface, the suspension, the, the wheel will bounce um, and the suspension will try to take some of that but when the suspension can no longer take any more that gets passed into the vehicle and that's what jolts you around as you're going along the difference between a, a standard bus and a tram or a train is that trams and, and trains only have one point of connection between the wheels and axles and the vehicle, and that's a, and that's what's called the bogey, which is in the middle uh, of of the vehicle, and then the rest of the body sits on these two big air cushions. In in this case, so modern high speed rail vehicles, where where this technology has been borrowed from, use air cushions. They don't use springs or pistons uh, like are in um, uh, suspension and. Um, if you're sad enough like me to look at the bogies on a train, you'll see that most of them are actually using springs um, uh, within Australia, which is, uh, you know, that it's an, it is literally an 18th century technology. Um, whereas this is, uh, this is a 21st century uh, level technology where they actually inflate and deflate, deflate these air cushions as they're going along in order to try and keep the, the body level. Um, so anyone who's been on high-speed rail um, overseas, you can place a coin on the windowsill and it will stay, stay standing up um, if it's a good high-speed rail. Uh, and, that's, and that's what they are trying to do with this. Now, this isn't a unique technology. It could, it could be applied to buses, but currently isn't. So... Uh, a lot of the traditional bus manufacturers follow this type of um, design. And Graham, how I've explained this to people is, is 
the ride quality that we had in that um, on the couple of examples we we travelled on was was basically identical to the 109 tram taking it to Box Hill in in Melbourne. It was indistinguishable um, yeah. when when you were on it. it. It looked and felt like a a cracked um, Melbourne tram, for want of a better description. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. So what that suspension does is it enables you to have the same interior of a tram. Um, there's a you know lovely photo of Holly, um, le you know le leaning up a leaning up against the um, the, the pole. Um, so and this wasn't a, this photo, even though it looks staged, um, wasn't. <laughs> I just happened to just happened to get to get lucky. Um, so you can have that, you can have that interior, um, whereas with a conventional bus, you need to have the seating. And there's another factor um, in conventional buses, even electric ones, which, are, which I'll talk about in a second, which mean that even if they had the same kind of suspension, they wouldn't be able to have uh, this type of seating. And the, this type of seating has been trialled multiple times uh, in Australia. Uh, within uh, regular uh, buses and articulated buses. Um, and because of the ride comfort, it has been rejected and they have gone back to the standard uh, seating arrangements. Um, so um, just some, you know, quick stats in, in comparison to other vehicles um, in terms of its lengths. Uh, height, widths, uh, and uh, 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 and the impact on um, pavement. So one of the things that we get asked quite a lot is, "Oh, well, won't it damage um, the pavement?" Uh, short answer is yes, it does damage the pavement a little bit more. Long answer is, but for the number of people that you can carry on the vehicle and potential mode shift towards it, it shortens the pavement by from 20 to 30 years to 18 to 25 years. So outside of the lifetime of uh, a lot of people um, having to deal with, with pavement maintenance. So, so there, is a, there is a slight increase in, in, in pavement damage when you have lower passenger volumes. But over the long term, it's actually not significant, particularly when you're doing cost programming for 20 to 30 years, your um, uh, net, um, your, your present value of uh, maintenance in 30 years time is, is quite low. Uh, so one of the reasons that the, you can have that interior is the way the vehicle is, is actually driven. So in a normal bus, you have a single motor uh, at the back, uh, which provides all of the drive. So what happens is when, you're, when the vehicle is starting out, the tires are digging into the pavement and they're trying to stay stuck into the pavement and the motor is pushing against that. So the, and when that friction is broken, the entire vehicle lurches forward. So that's why you get that mm, as, as a bus goes off and depending on how hard the accelerator is pressed. Um, and then again, when the vehicle's stopping, the front tires will dim. The, so the front tires will dig into the pavement and the rest of the vehicle will actually try and rotate around those front tires. So the back of the vehicle wants to do this and flip the vehicle over. And then the other tires dig in as well. So that's why you get the second lurch when a bus stops. With the trackless tram, because it's like a tram or a train, it has what's called push pull. So it's being pushed from the back and pulled from the front. So it has a smooth acceleration and braking. So you don't get the lurch that, that comes from it. So, 
and you can program the acceleration and braking so that it has that same level of acceleration speed um, as a tram or a train does, which is about one metre per second. So getting every second, you go a metre faster. Um, and then the reason why it can turn in the same turning circle as a, a standard bus is because every single axle is, a, is also a turning axle. Um, and we have replicated that turning path using the technical information about the vehicle um, and building that uh, ourselves. Um, not just taking it from information that was provided to us by CRRC. So, so we've actually been able to demonstrate that the vehicle will be able to turn in the path that, that, that they claim it will. So it's a, it's, it's a very, very tight turn. Um, and just going back to the length of the, the, the overall dimensions of the vehicle. So um, it is about the same length uh, of a uh, normal uh, tracked tram, uh, a, a little bit longer than a uh, articulated bus, um, and it has about the same width and height uh, as a as a track tram. Um, interestingly, so if you look at the uh, image on the right hand side, it doesn't use wing mirrors uh, like a standard bus does. Um, it uses cameras and has a it has a all round three D um, look down cameras uh, on it, and it's got lidar and radar. Which, when we went over there in twenty nineteen, a three D uh, look down camera was um, uh, exceedingly un uncommon in cars. Um, but now, any a lot of electric cars, in fact, most of them now have that as part of their standard package. Um, and it's becoming increasingly uh, pre prevalent uh, in the market. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought, thought I'd actually gotten um, rid of this one. Um, so this is just some technical information comparing track the ART with light rail, which, uh, which uh, trams, which is called LRT here, and um, bus rapid transit on a cost um, comparison when you're including uh, capital costs and your ability to um, provide a high quality of service. So, you know, uh, relatively fast um, in comparison to the number of people that you're, that you're carrying. Uh, so where could, it, where could it be used? So I'll first start at the right-hand side, which is the, un the unsuitable use cases. So trips that are long. Um, so the um, uh, Eastern Busway uh, in Melbourne, um, that's uh, uh, um, currently um, being um, built as part of uh, Northeast Link, um, where you have a one-seat ride and there's no one and off. Very unsuitable for that type of thing. Uh, Interregional uh, trips. Uh, again, you know, you, are, you you don't want to be using this, for example, um, uh, um, between Colac and Geelong. Um, so you wouldn't be saying, oh, well, we could just do a trackless tram and into you know increase uh, rather than increasing train services. Um, very high passenger loads. So once you get above about six thousand people an hour you really should be doing it using a proper tram. But this can be a um, step change towards having a reintroduction of, of light rail network. Uh, very low passenger volumes, um, you're better, better off having um, uh, electric buses. Uh, and that's partly to do uh, with the capital costs of doing it. Um, and very low demand. So where, where you don't have lots of people, um, or very low densities, uh, then you should be using uh, small on-demand electric buses. So in the Geelong context, there's three possible um, use cases. So there's passenger turnover, which is the 
trial um, uh, route that that we that we've uh, developed up. Um, so closely spaced stops, short trips, people hopping on and off. So um, collecting, uh, connecting uh, uh, South Geelong and um, GMHBA station through to Central Geelong, Geelong station, uh, the hospitals um, and potential park and rides. And because you don't need seats, it's quiet. Um, it will work within the existing road network. Uh, urban generation and regeneration. So where you want your land use character to change, uh, because it is quiet, because you can have um, the value of the place being recognised as being leading edge. Um, so, you know, connecting the student, new student accommodation uh, to CBD um, and uh, ma making higher quality places. Uh, and then also load and go. So um, where you want to load in a high number of people. Um, so, so anyone who's caught a tram um, out to the, the tennis, tennis centre in, uh, in Melbourne, um, you know, at the at the end of the day, lots of people wanting to get onto the tram and then going to Melbourne. Similarly, from GMHB Stadium into the CBD of Geelong, you want to move as many people as quickly as possible so that they're then shopping and dining and getting entertainment in the CBD. Um, so you want so rather than having um, as uh, the Sydney Lord Mayor um, put in a um, newspaper editorial this morning, a conga line of buses. You have a few of these vehicles and then you load up a couple of thousand people at a time and you move them very quickly. And then they don't, they're not given the opportunity to go, ah, no, nah, I'll just go home because it's going to be too hard to, to get into town. You know, you want all those people flowing into the, into the CBD afterwards. Um, so this is just a, a summary of places where it's being considered. Um, anyone who's who um, followed the uh, federal budget, um, unfortunately, as closely as I do, um, would have seen that the uh, Caulfield Monash um, proposal had its business case um, funding withdrawn um, as part of the budget, uh, and the uh, currently the only. Um, realistic proposal is in, in Stirling in uh, northern Perth. Um, and that's also um, the uh, doubtful as, as to um, its funding status uh, at the moment for, for actually doing a actually doing a trial. So in terms of Geelong, so the actual nuts and um, uh, um, of the of the detail. So um, this is a study that um, we did uh, with Deakin University, um, particularly looking at uh, how they can um, enhance their car uh, park and ride opportunity. And it wasn't purely about the ART. Um, it was about a zero emissions uh, shuttle. Um, but we did look at um, a route which would work with buses and the ART. Um, but we did find that the ART does provide the highest uh, level of, of potential patronage. Uh, so starting at, at South Geelong um, uh, and then uh, going, going north uh, up to Geelong Station, down to the waterfront, uh, back to the hospital's precinct uh, and then down to uh, Triboys. So this was very much looking at um, how can we connect Park and rides, the stadium, the CBD, the hospitals, and create a service which is a, a, a turnover um, based network. Obviously, with the Com Games um, coming uh, to Geelong, the uh, service, you know, that uh, load and go service that I was talking about, you know, you would you would just run it straight from the stadium. Uh, in, into the city. Uh, and 
So what we found is just purely with a, a, a normal two-way shuttle service that uh, we think we can pick up potentially about 1,500 trips during the, the AM peak and also save on the amount of car parking that is required in the Geelong CBD. So when you consider that a brand new car parking space that is above ground is anywhere between $40,000 and $60,000 per space these days um, from uh, concept investigation through to construction, that's a lot of money that can be reinvested into the community or saved by developers or reduce housing costs um, when you can uh, pick up uh, that many people. Uh, and that is the last of the technical detail. I think Brett gave the little blurb about Urbis and who we are. Um, but what I um, unfortunately didn't mention at the start was that we do a lot of transport work in Geelong. So we've delivered the um, uh, draft uh, G21 integrated transport strat strategy for G21. Uh, we've also done uh, green travel plans for Deakin University. And then also obviously the, um, the, the zero emissions shuttle scoping study that I mentioned just before. So, um, Graham, if I could get you to just flip back a slide, cause that's quite a powerful slide. Um, in terms of a potential route. I think as touched on, um, there is a perception that the general public prefer trams and trains to, to, to buses. In part, this is because of the ride quality that Graham's talked to, but it also it comes down to the certainty of provision that you get with a tracked transport. So you, you get, you know where it's going, you know when it's coming, you get better, better weather protection, um, and there's a perceived permanence from those rail options that you don't get with a bus option um, and people vote with their feet and I'm probably a good example of this having emigrated to Australia from the UK and one of the key determining things for me was um, moving to Melbourne over Sydney because I love the, the tram network and I love the ability to get get around um, public transport does influence um, land use decisions and public and private sector investment a good example of this is Melbourne where um, Again, to use my local example on, on Melbourne Road near where I live, there is a tram that goes through and, and council has in turn put on a um, growth zone onto those corridors, which, which encourages four-storey plus development, which has been taken up by developers, whereas Taronga Road, which intersects with that, has exactly the same road cross-section, um, but is just serviced by buses. And as a consequence, you don't see the same leveling of private sector investment on Taronga Road that you do on Malvern Road. And you haven't seen the council put in a higher order zone to encourage height and densities that, that you would do. Um, having spoken with both councils and um, developer clients on this ART journey, that they've all offered the opinion that it would drive changes to land use designations and it would drive um, inward investment in those corridors because the people make land use decisions and, and planning decisions and the decision to invest themselves in an apartment or whatever it might be around access to public transport and you get that with an ART brand um, which you don't get with, with a bus. Very few people make um, big investment decisions based upon proximity to a bus or a bus stop. That's my, that's my two second rant, Jen, probably to finish off on, on that element. No, thank you, Brett, and thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, and that slide, I, I don't know if I'd seen it, probably hadn't missed it during the years, but I think it's really important to stress because there's lots of questions on the chat, by the way, so I'll go to those in a moment. But it really is about Geelong having such a low use of public transport. We feel like this is a piece of technology that ticks a lot of boxes. And, yes, Vicky will come to the question because it is a zero emissions vehicle. Um, but I think it, yeah, as I said, ticks a lot of boxes because we need to have a catalyst for change in Geelong with less than 9% of all trips to the city um, and within the city um, on public or active transport. So what I might do is say, firstly, thank you, Brett and Graham, but I might just read a few of the questions that are in the chat, Graham, and then I can open it up to people who might want to ask a question directly. But Matt Fletcher has asked, 
Can the trams be a precursor to a light rail network, allowing validation of route network and passenger loading? Uh, yes, um, and, and that's that's a, a perfect opportunity to uh, demonstrate the viability of of, of light rail, um, and you can keep the, this running while you're building the light rail. So once you've got the you know, there's obviously a, you know, very um, intense competition for resources um, in Victoria. Um, and once you've got the light rail operating, then you can trial it on, on, on another route. So, you you know, it's not it's not like if you were to put light rail down Morrible Street, uh, that's when um, after trialling this that you throw the trams away, you go, okay, well, where can we move them to? And and trial and, and see if that works. So, you know, will it, you know, um, would High Street, you know, then start, you know, becoming less car yard um, uh, oriented and, and start changing if you, if you then moved it over to there, for example. Yeah, thanks, Graham. <clears throat> um, Vicky from Geelong Sustainability has a couple of questions. So I might just put them all together. She did ask about whether we'd have enough people to make it viable, but I've sort of put a few comments in the chat saying really it's about getting the trial up and then obviously we can look at specific usages depending on, um, you know, if we can get the trial up in the first place. And then obviously we've got not just population growth, but a state government plan to have 12,000 people living in a city at the moment we've only got 2,000 so I think it needs to be all part of a bigger plan to actually get people mm -hmm. out of cars um, but yeah, um, yeah. Graham, I don't think you touched on the zero emissions element and the power requirements and charging if you could explain yeah. thank you yeah um, so it is 100% um, electric uh, it charges um, up to 350 kilowatts uh, charges um, using overhead pantographs or you can use a, 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 a plug um, charger um, in a bus depot. Um, uh, so it really comes down to, you know, the power purchase agreement uh, about, you know, the source of the electricity. So if the electricity is sourced from 100% renewables, then it's 100% uh, uh, green energy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Toby Cooper has asked a question about um, there was a comment that there was technology that the technology is not suitable for very high or very low uses. So I assume somewhere in the middle. Are there any uh, comments on its usefulness, viability across the day? For example, across the course of a day, the demand is likely to be much higher during peak periods and first thing in the morning. Yeah. Uh, so you so you have. Um, all public transport operations have two components. One's the capital cost, so purchasing the vehicles, building stops, et cetera. And then there's the operational cost. So your operational cost is really based on your number of drivers and the amount of energy that you're using. So you obviously want to have higher frequency uh, during the peak periods and then you taper off during the middle of the day. But if you're, if you're running a, a tram at every... Uh, 10 minutes during the off-peak period. Uh, if you're filling um, that up, then that's the equivalent of having to run four buses. So your operational cost would be having would be having to um, be uh, three to four times higher um, if a, for the equivalent number of passengers. Um, what we do know is that successful shuttles are fully loaded all day. They're not just a peak, peak period thing because People use them to get to and from school, go to a shop, you know, go to a go to a cafe. Uh, particularly with hospital precincts, you have lots of changeover with passengers and the hospital employees moving back and forth between um, different parts of the town. And the the uh, Wollongong um, uh, loop uh, shuttles, um, they are. Um, they run, and, and admittedly they're standard buses, they run full from 9am to about 7pm. Uh, thank you. Um, Marie, I think, has left. I can't see the chat, sorry, to see if she's gone, but I might leave her question till after this one because it's more about what do we do next moving forward for Committee for Geelong, which I'll, I'll explain. Um, Lurleen Letts asked about whether the shelters 
are in the middle of the road or on the side of the street. And I know, Brett, you put an answer in there. And I'll just flag, obviously, we've got an issue here in Geelong where current bus shelters in Marrable Street are really blocking and not advantageous to the retail precinct in Marrable Street. So one of the big wins we see here is that if we can get this trial up and have it as more permanent fixtures that they could run through the middle of Marble Street, which is a massive boulevard for us here in Geelong. And it means that then those shelters could be freed up from the side of the streets. So I don't know if you want to add anything to what Graham has said. Uh, sorry, what Brett has said, Graham. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so that they can be um, basically anywhere that you want, and because it's a, a tram vehicle with doors on both sides, you can swap between the two, depending on where you are. And you can leave cars in Marrable Street as an example. I think I'm not an engineer, but it's a really wide street. You'd assume if you could have this running up the middle of the road, you don't have to close the street off. So just like um, Brett has said, so that's that's the hope. Um, I've got a technical question from Toby. Uh, Cooper, could the suspension technology to provide ride comfort also be applied to the normal bus fleet? Uh, so there are buses that use air cushions already, um, but they still have the same uh, lurching issues. So, uh, so far as I'm aware, um, and there's also a height uh, a difference issue as, as well because um, just the way um, buses are manufactured. So uh, you may get some some of the benefits, but I'm not sure that you'll get all of the benefits. Um, you know, so I know electric buses have less vibration, which is another one of the, um, you know, issues with with riding buses. Um, so, you know, that the vibr the, the, so there are, yeah, there would be um, some improvements, but in, like Brett said, the um, level of confidence, um, particularly of developers, in you know this is a a, a premier type of uh, service so they may be willing to invest more and transition areas more quickly and and we're seeing that with the the sydney um cbd and, and southeast light rail that the areas where that's gone in are transitioning very quickly now yeah, which is great. So um, I'll take Marie's question now saying what's the action plan from here, what's needed and how can Committee for Geelong members help move this forward? Um, there's lots of questions in there. So I'll do my best to summarise where we're at. Um, earlier I was talking about the fact that we've just gone into caretaker mode, so we're fully in an election campaign. Um, we put the proposal to um, the Victorian government last year oh. And I'm aware that has gone through a process within the ALP. Um, the opposition is also aware. I noticed that Matthew Guy made an announcement about potential train stations to Bell Post Hill and Bannockburn, which was interesting, but then improving the bus network, which is a big issue for us. So either way, um, moving forward, the Committee for Geelong, and look, obviously I'm leaving at the end of the year. If we can't get a commitment from... Um, a party, both parties before the election, which, you know, I'm still hopeful for. It's something that should be continued to push um, leading into the Com Games. So I'm aware of some conversations that have occurred with um, Jacinta Allen. We've presented to the Minister. She's now also Commonwealth Games as well as Transport Infrastructure. Chris Cousins is a very strong proponent of this, still a member for Geelong. Um, so without betraying some confidences. Um, part of the reason we wanted to do the briefing today was obviously to get members aware of the technical details because, you know, I do a lot of media about this and, hey, it's just a bus, Jen. Well, it isn't just a bus. There's some significant um, opportunities with this technology to change people's behaviour, which is really important because it's like a tram. Um, to the point made earlier, it could lead to light rail down the future. Who knows? Because if you can test and prove that there's demand, that's that's a longer term issue. But we've also had um, overtures looking at different areas in Geelong, for example, the Spirit of Tassie. You know, there's some interest in trying to work out how you can connect it to the Spirit of Tasmania. Um, there's significant issues in and around Armstrong Creek. Um, I know there's been a commitment uh, or a plan to have buses more regularly to Armstrong Creek, but Armstrong Creek to Torquay and also the Bellarine. So I know Mayor Asher is no longer Mayor Asher, but I know there was interest coming from um, some councillors about how they could resolve some of their transport issues bigger 
in, in sort of um, a bigger network sense. So what I'd appreciate is if any members see media about this initiative, if there's social media about this initiative that you get online, you support um, why you want to see this happening in Geelong because it's a very highly political environment at the moment. Um, yes, Kate, the trial was costed and I think that was public. It was some upwards of $7 million, and that includes doing the complete trial and testing, getting it accredited, and then also I think, was it one or two vehicles? Get, you've got to get the vehicle out is, is the bigger cost. So you, you get the vehicle out on loan. You're not buying the vehicle because you've got to get it accredited first. And then you have to actually potentially make some modifications. But that includes, I think, temporary stops. I'm trying to look at Graham's face. I'd have to look at the detail. There's a quite a detailed costed proposal that went to the state government a year ago. So that's all been costed and, and understood to be embedded in a process, I, I hope, um, politically now. So how do the vehicles got? Can they be built locally? Very good question, Kate. So I'll finish off what I was saying more about the fact that I really want people to get on board with this. And, you know, we get a lot of people who aren't members of the committee and outside of Geelong really supporting this as well, which is great. But, you know, politically speaking, it's always good to get a bit of a vibe out there in the community in an election period because it's not a big ask, to be honest. A $7 million trial, you know, if it can be done and dusted within a year or two, you could see them running for the Com Games, which is obviously a really big opportunity for us. Built locally, probably not for me to say because, um, you know, if you look, for example, though, at about things that are happening with um, procurement with the Victorian government at the moment, there is a commitment to local first. So I think, for example, please correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who knows, but it's like 50% of the trains are built here in Victoria. So they might procure them, say, for example, from China, CRRC, but you have contracts locally to then assemble, finish in Australia. So that would be the procurement policy from the big government and the company that, or well, the, the organisation that makes the Ad Advanced Railers Tram, CRRC, I mean, they're a massive, massive organisation, but they also have a contract already with the state government for the new um, trains. So there's an already existing arrangement. If this happens and there's obviously interest, I could see that there is the opportunity to do a component of the manufacturing in Australia, but that's obviously way down the track. But we're going to have to obviously have a way to get these vehicles made. And you saw the potential demand across the country. Our hope was always that we could get the trial here in Geelong and be the first. But, you know, if City of Stirling, who have the federal government um, bid behind them, and that's through Richard Miles and Catherine King, um, as well is that they're, they're doing a lot of work around business case studies, et cetera, et cetera. If it gets into Perth first, I'm not going to cry <laughs> Mia River. It's literally then getting them transported from um, WA to Geelong to then continue the trial. So I think I've answered that question and we're right on time. Transport emissions are over 20% of our carbon emissions. Yes, we need a circuit breaker, Vicky. You know exactly what we're talking about here. We need to get Geelong out of this car-centric um, situation and it's a great incentive then, hope for the council to look at implementing their park and ride service and their car parking strategy, which I think is yet to be released, but that mm. all links in beautifully. Sorry, and Brett. Jen, I was going to say, Jen, on, on that on that last point, we did have a we have had a couple of catch-ups with Department of Transport about this, and um, one of the things that they were talking about was how proud they were of their upcoming changes to improve bus bus provision in, in Victoria, and and they wax lyrical about that, that some of the upcoming changes, which were going to include all door boarding to, to buses as opposed to just the front door. Um, and, and and potentially some nicer sort of bus stops. Um, I, I don't think either of those two things is going to be a circuit breaker and make a difference between somebody getting a bus or not getting a bus. I, I think I think um, I think they need to lift their horizons a little bit in terms of sort of dealing with those carbon emissions. Um, you know, whatever the technology, whether it's you know. Um, solar powered buses, whatever whatever weird and wonderful technology they come up with, I think it's got to be something which really attracts people and makes a difference um, and, and, and really is a, 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 a transformative change to the system, I think. 
No, I agree. And I think um, it's not like buses will go. We still need buses in Geelong. Hopefully it means that then the, the network planning is better for suburban Geelong. And then you link in, obviously, to the trackless tram. Last comment from Toby, 7 million seems cheap for a trial. I agree, Toby. And I'm just assuming it's because we've got a great relationship with the people involved. And I know that they're very keen for this to happen. Um, that was the cost. And I'm going to look at Graham straight down the Zoom and say that was the cost we were given, which was to loan the vehicles. Yeah. 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 So, so so, one of the things about um, these type of vehicle trials is the vehicle either has to be destroyed, used for another trial, or re-exported. So the only circumstance in which the you, you would have to pay the full cost of the vehicles is if they were being destroyed rather than being used for a trial somewhere else or um, re-exported. Um, and then there's obviously the, you know, the cost of a, you know, long-term um, operation, which is, which is separate. Um, Kate's asking how much they cost. It's there. That is not a figure I'd sort of be able to talk about with any great authority at the moment. Um, it really depends, I suppose, on, I assume, the nature of either the trial or then obviously the forward ongoing orders. But I know they're cheaper than, are they cheaper than trams, Graham? Is that a dumb question? They yeah. are significantly cheaper than trams. Yeah. They're, they're more expensive than buses, but, but uh, cheaper than trams. And the, the current advice would, we have is that it would depend on the level of commitment. Um, yeah. Yeah, to, about to, the deal, to, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do the deal is probably the point. And look, if you're going to get a really highfalutin e-bus, someone like Carly Lovell knows this, they're upwards of 700000 plus each for a e proper bus. But I just remember talking to Carly about this a while ago. Yeah, about, about 850 for a 12-and-a-half-metre uh, um, uh, electric bus that's Australian-built and just... Bear in mind that an Australian built bus is only the shell and the seats. All of the drivetrain is imported. Yeah. yeah. But they're really great questions. I'm really hoping as a result of this, I might wrap it up because we're after 12. I know people have to go, but um, you know, I've been on this journey since um, early 2019, actually, when I first had the brief. We were talking about light rail and then the trackless tram initiative, I think it was May 2019. So It'd be really great to see something like this happen. Um, but I just want to thank Graham and Brett for their time today. And um, I assume, Graham, you're okay for this to go on YouTube more publicly. Thank you. I've had so many questions. I've done my best over the years to answer it, but so good to have everyone listening and being able to ask questions. So fingers crossed and please get behind it as much as you can. And um, we'll see what we can do as we lead into the state election and beyond. So thank you so much.